great to have you all come out and hear me talk about the incredible dolphins in, in Shark Bay. I just want to say we don't have any copies of the book I published last year here, but you can order it on Amazon and go to your bookstore to get the hard copies if you'd like. Um, so I also want to salute the Living Desert and Jim, Jim for their efforts to save the Baquita. Um, it's a really important thing they're doing there. So people, the first question people ask me is, is uh, why, why did you get interested in studying dolphins? And I've been interested in studying dolphins for a long time, since at least my teens. And the interest was driven by trying to figure out what they're doing with these big brains. You know, after humans, dolphins have the largest brains on the planet when you control for body size. And brains are very expensive, so they have to be doing something important. Half of the, 20% uh, of the oxygen you take in goes to fuel your brain. When you're a tot, it's about 50%. So something has to be important, has to be going on. And we wanted to find a place where we could watch dolphins at close range and learn about their society and their social relationships. Um, it's very difficult for a terrestrial mammal to watch an aquatic one. Uh, we wanted some place that would be comparable, hopefully, to Gombe, where Jane Goodall habituated a community of chimpanzees and was able to sit in very close proximity and watch them interact with each other. And they used bananas for a time to habituate the chimpanzees. So we needed some place like that. Where would it be? Well, I was an undergraduate at UC Santa Cruz when I heard about this amazing site in Western Australia. And I think many of you might sort of look at that and that'll remind you of a certain a suntan lotion commercial from the 1960s. <laughs> yeah, so this, this, this uh, place is in Shark Bay. It's a large feature on Australia's west coast. Um, it was right there. We'll zoom in a little bit. And it, it's, a, it's about 50 miles across and 90 miles deep, and it's bisected here by the Perron Peninsula. And uh, the, the indigenous name for Shark Bay is Guthorguda, which means two waters, and we started a project on this side of the peninsula in 1982, more recently in 2007 on this, and this other site's been incredibly complementary. Uh, and so we've merged these two projects, and we're very, very excited about what we're doing uh, going forward with that merger. So Shark Bay is, is, has the largest seagrass beds in the world. And that's why it's such an amazing place. Those large seagrass beds support a lot of everything. A lot of sharks, it's called Shark Bay for a good reason. A lot of dugongs, they're kind of like a manatee. Uh, tons of sea turtles, just we see them everywhere. Tons of fish, lots of marine life, incredible habitat. And it's, you can see it's largely set, uh, separated from the Indian Ocean by these submerged islands and, and, and barrier islands. And so when you're out in the bay and there's no ocean swell, if the wind drops, which it does once in a while, uh, you can, it's just a sheet of glass and you're floating out there like you're on an aquarium, uh, looking at all the incredible marine life. So this is the beast. It's the Indo-Pacific bottlenose dolphin. These guys are uh, smaller than the bottlenose dolphins you may have seen uh, around the US and our waters, about two meters. Um, and, and they're, I think, prettier and more elegant and smarter. I'm a little biased, you know. So this, this is a campground on the east side of Perron Peninsula called Monkey Maya. You can see why the camp is here. It's the only place along the peninsula where deeper water comes in close and people can launch boats and go fishing. And so for decades, there have been several dolphins coming in to take fish from people in the shallows. And that is what initially attracted us. This was going to be our dolphin gombi, where dolphins, you know, instead of bananas, it was fish, and we could watch wild dolphins at close range. So uh, after we graduated, um, we went down there on the, the classic shoestring budget with hand-rolled black and white film, dome tents, we hitchhiked up from Perth and we had no boat. But we learned a lot watching the animals in close. And then for two days, we were able to borrow a dinghy and go offshore. And we found that these several dolphins that came in to take fish from people were part of a huge society. Those two days, we just went from group to group to group to group. And we saw that the ones that came in were part of the society, swimming with them. And that sealed the deal. This was just going to be an amazing place to learn about dolphins. And as you'll see, I, I call this the uh, 
the Rosetta Stone for learning about dolphin intelligence in the wild. And I hope to convince you that that's, uh, that's actually what it is. So they, they have what we call a fission-fusion grouping pattern. Um, and it's very much like us. So they're not all together in one big group throughout the day. Rather, they come and go in groups of different sizes, splitting up and joining, just like we do. If you think about all the different groups you've been in today, uh, they're very dynamic like that, joining and splitting up. So it's fun to follow them and see who they're going to get in trouble with next. Um, and this is looking from the, the boat. So here's how we identify individual dolphins. Their dorsal fins uh, have different nicks and scars and shapes, and they're all very identifiable. We take pictures every time we see them, but we can get to know them you know, by sight, um, a lot of them, and we get really practiced at it. Um, and it's sort of like they have this individual identification flag that they pop above the surface every, every time they take a breath. So we can actually watch them and name them in real time. And that gives us tremendous access to figuring out what's going on. And of course, yes, their fins can change. They get in little tiffs and with each other and so on. And I am still amazed that in those two days offshore in 1982, we photographed this individual, Real Notch, who plays a really important role throughout my book. He was a master dolphin politician. Uh, and we sort of bow a little bit whenever we came across him in later years. So here's his picture on hand roll black and white film in 1982, and here he is in 2012. Uh, 30 years later, we followed his incredible 30-year career. So here we are, Shark Bay is out back to the sea, and it is semi-arid scrub right down. There's beautiful colors there. And yes, when I go for my walks in the evening, I see emus and echidnas and kangaroos and all these sorts of things. So they were out in our little boats and following the dolphins. Beautiful place. And we can watch all kinds of behavior. We can watch them feeding in all kinds of different ways. They'll chase solitary fish, schooling fish. They'll probe in the seagrass on the bottom for fish. They'll chase skimming fish at the surface. Uh, redfish, bluefish, all kinds of fish. But what's really interesting about dolphins and marine mammals in general, and unlike terrestrial mammals, is that within populations, individuals will often specialize in techniques they use to, to hunt and fish, and then the kinds of prey they go after. And we have a number of really interesting cases of these kinds of feeding specializations in Shark Bay. At the top of Parent Peninsula, there's a steep beach where they'll actually strand feed and, uh, and chasing fish. There's just several dolphins that do this. Um, probably the most famous of these foraging techniques is sponge carrying. Um, this is a kind of tool use. So as you probably know, a sponge is a marine animal that grows up from the bottom, looks like a plant actually, and it's a filter feeder. And the dolphins will pluck these off. These are cone-shaped sponges that fit over their snouts like a glove. Water pressure holds it on. And they'll poke around the bottom trying to scare up fish. It's mostly females that do this. It's a learned behavior that's passed down. And it does seem to give them a certain advantage in some areas. There's a certain kind of prey they apparently can go after that other dolphins don't normally get with this sponge carrying. And this is a picture I took in about 2010 of a dolphin we called the original sponge mom. <laughs> because we named her that because she had a little sponge babe in, in, in the mid-1980s. And here she was with her sponge, doing her sponging thing 25 years later. <laughs> yeah. So they often socialize and rest in groups. And one reason you rest in groups is because of sharks. There are a lot of tiger sharks in Shark Bay. Uh, and this is a very gentle nibble. So in 1994, I had a 19-year-old assistant um, start with me, and he's, he's now the Dean of Marine Sciences at FIU, but for his PhD, he, uh, one, one thing that he did was counted uh, shark, shark bite scars on our dolphins, and over 70% have uh, shark bite scars. So um, you know how people say, oh, I'd love to be a dolphin, or you think dolphins can chase away sharks. Well, not so much. So here you're looking down from the boat at a, at a pup nursing from its mom. 
and they will nurse for several years for a mom, and then they'll have an extended juvenile period, and females will mature and get pregnant and have a one-year gestation and typically give birth when they're 12, sometimes 11, and males will start in engaging in adult alliance behavior, typically 13, 14, 15, right in there. And they, if they're really lucky, they can live to be into their 40s. Um, this dolphin was not so lucky. This is how we found her. She had just washed up on the beach. But we can see from this that she's quite old because of her speckles. Our dolphins begin to develop speckles around their genitals when they're just eight to nine, and then they spread with age, and she's got lots of speckles. She's quite old. This is actually a famous dolphin named Holyfin who came into the beach. And when I showed up in 1985, Ranger came up to me and said, Holy Finn didn't look too good. She's surfacing in a really strange way. And sure enough, I went down there and she was bobbing to the surface like a newborn. Newborns are little blubber balls. They don't have much musculature, so they pop to the surface like a cork. And she was surfacing like that. That could not be good. And I called Sam Ridgway, the top marine mammal vet in the world, and he said we typically see that minutes to hours before death. She lingered like that for two weeks, and we found her. She didn't come in one day. We went out the next day and found her uh, just coming ashore. And they sent her down to Perth, and the necropsy came back very quickly. A stingray spine had penetrated the left ventricle of her heart. These spines are serrated, and so once it was in her, its direction was clear and her fate was sealed. There was no external wound. It could have happened weeks or you know, who knows how much earlier. And so she basically died of congestive heart failure. So it was very sad, and they flew the flags at half-mast. So petting and gentle rubbing, just like primates, chimpanzees groom each other and stroke each other, dolphins express friendly behavior by petting each other with their flippers uh, they do a lot of this, and it helps them form friendships, uh, maintain them after they've had a bit of an argument or something, um, form new ones. Uh, females do a lot of petting too, but they also have a special way they touch each other, where one female will just rest her stiff flipper against the side of another and slightly behind her, close to the kind of infant positions where infants are riding along. And this often occurs when they're being harassed by obnoxious males. So we think it's a kind of support behavior. It's very cool because when they're doing this, they do it for a few surfacings or up to 20 minutes. It looks like they're glued together. It's very striking. And then you'll see they're playing and roughhousing and flopping over each other. And here you see one male mounting another. These guys have a lot of social sex. Sex is not just for reproduction. It's a social tool that's used in all contexts. So they may use it during aggression or when they're being friendly with each other in all combinations. So the closest thing on terra firma would be the bonobo. Does anybody know what a bonobo is? All of you do? All right, they're kind of chimpanzee, but they're very different from the common chimpanzee you're most familiar with. I call them hippie chimps because their you know, hair's part of the middle. They look kind of like hippies. And, and they have, they're, they're much mellower than common chimps. And, and, and they have also a lot of social sex. So you can think of bonobos as, as terrestrial dolphins or dolphins as, as aquatic bonobos. So I'm going to talk a lot about the males, but to understand what males are doing, you have to understand what females are doing because males are primarily seeking receptive estrus females in their roamings around. And the key word for females is variation. Variation in the groups you see them in. Some females are pretty solitary, like the sponge carriers, you know, they have to spend all day long with their sponge alone, you know. Oh, don't like you feel sorry for their calves. They don't have much of a social life. And some females just, you know, rocking all over the place. They're probably chasing more schooling fish, bigger groups. And their range size is very enormously. So this is sort of the peninsula, and each one of these shapes is, is an individual female's home range. So little shapes and big ones, and they vary by an order of magnitude. So Joy's friend had a small range of only seven square kilometers. A blip. She had 100 square kilometers, so she was all over the place. And we think that this variation in these, these things have, relates to the different ways they, they chase and catch fish. Like I said, if you're a sponge carrier, eh, you don't have much of a social life. Um, so in the context of all this fission and fusion in the, in the mid-80s, we were seeing quite 
strong and stable associations between males. Pa males were swimming around in pairs and trios. Some of these pairs and trios were so stable uh, that we just call them by like their name. Of, so Trips and Bite and Cetus was one trio. We'd say, oh, there's TBC, because they're always together. Chop and Bottom Hook and Lambda was another trio. Oh, there's CBL. So what were they doing? Because if males are simply competing for access to estrous females, and only one male can sire a calf, right? So why are they hanging out together, right? Had to be something important. And it turns out that when the female's calf is about two and a half, she starts cycling again, and the males form these aggressively maintained consortships with the females. These consortships can last for minutes to weeks at a time. So here you see two males flanking the female there, and there's the nice little picture of the female, the two males. So while we were seeing this offshore, in short, monkey Maya, we had three males, Snubby, Sickle, and Beebe. They were real troublemakers or feature a lot in my book. And they would bring these females into the beach who did not want to be there. You know, they weren't used to people. They forced them into the shallows. And, and so there's a particular vocalization called pops. I'm going to play for you. And I was able to study and write a paper on this pop vocalization. Study, and, and, and it was based on pops we heard in air. I mean, that's just how crazy it is that we were able to, to study a dolphin vocalization in air. Um, so that's Snubby, and he's guarding. And that's Hana, the female out there behind him, and Sickles past her. There you go, there's intense pop. There's that pop in the sound. Turn it up Hana's a little bit, maybe? Right. She turns around towards him. And she sort of moseys on in towards him. And, and if she doesn't do, uh, approach him over several times, it may escalate the aggression. And offshore, we'd see similar behavior. So here we have the female is, is hanging out tight with pointer, and bottom hook is off a ways, and maybe he's not too happy about that. So what you're going to see is he's orienting towards them, and he jerks his head up and down, makes this crack vocalization. It sounds like a rifle shot. And then he approaches and starts popping. That's a pointer in the female on the calf. Boom, right? So who are too happy? The males can be real brats. So here you see uh, two males chasing a female. When they capture a female, it can be quick, not no big drama, or it can last for a couple miles of chasing. So here we've just come up uh, after they've just captured a female, and we just have figured out that it's the female clam, and you can watch what happens next. That's her clam. They've got clam. It's clam. Wow. Who's up front with her? Wow, bolt, like bolt, bolt, bolt. Bolt, she bolted. Great. Great. Wow, look at her go. She's going. She's going. Right. They're not really chasing, are they? Oh. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they were chasing. So. The females try to get away sometimes, and they just rock it off. So we understand now what the pairs and trios are about. They're cooperating to keep these females uh, with them for periods of time when the females are in estrus. That wasn't everything. So here we see that each of these pairs of trios had other pairs of trios they were buddies with. And this is, in fact, TBC and CBL in the 1980s. Look at these two trios, each one side by side, very synchronous. But what we, we, we studied this synchrony, and we found that one male in the group wasn't quite as synchronous as the other two were, and he wasn't with them as much. We call him the odd male out. So the question was, again, why do you have friendships between alliances if, again, they're just competing for access to estrus females? TBC, ooh, bottom hook's a little off, but that was typical, right? So I always say that August 19th, 1987, was the most exciting day ever on our project, because that's the day we discovered the function of these associations between alliances, the alliances of alliances. And what happened was that Snubby Sickle and BB had a consortship with Holy Finn in the Monkey Mai Shallows, and then Trips, Bite, and Cetus came right into the shallows. They'd never done that before. So we're all excited. We're thinking there's going to be a big fight, you know, and, and they approach within four meters, but nothing happens. And then they turn around and they left. It was anticlimactic, but I thought maybe the show isn't over. 
So I got in the boat, went offshore about a kilometer. They had joined up with Real Notch and High, their buddy alliance. Real Notch and High already had a female. Then the two alliances turned back and started steaming towards Monkey Maya. They got up and they just launched right into the beaches and they just blasting, chasing, fighting uh, down the length of the park among the mooring lines past the boats. And they emerged at the end and Trips, Bite, and Cetus had Holy Finn. And Snubby, Sickle, and BB were all upset about it and acting like they were going to do something about it, but they didn't. Um, and we had a video camera that day, but it was the person's first time using it. It didn't work out so well, but I have a little clip, and I just want to show you how excited I was about it. So they this. got Holy Finn. They went in there and stole her. Holy Finn's in the middle of trips by Cetus and Real Not Shy and Munch and all these guys. I don't believe this. So trips invite uh, one guy reinforcement, huh? Man, this is this is like science fiction. This is like this is like science fiction. I want you to hold that thought. I want to come back and explain why this was to me so mind blowing. I would make a comment like this is science fiction. Before that, though, I want to show you another day where Real Notch and High and Trips Bite and Cetus came in and attacked Snubby Sickle and BB. But this time, Snubby Sickle and BB had their buddy alliance with them, Wave and Shave, and the chasing and fighting lasted 70 minutes and covered five miles. So here you're just going to see a clip, and yeah, they dolphins can bite each other some, but their main weapon is those powerful tails and the tail stalks. So what you're going to see is they're trying to hit each other and avoid being hit. Watch out, neutral. Did you hit it? No. They're fighting. They're just fighting all over the place here now. And there's another big chase going on down there. So I was really excited about all that. <laughs> so uh, I was, yeah, I say kill it was kill the motor because I was worried they're going to run into the motor. They weren't paying attention, but they didn't, fortunately. So we now know that these associations between alliances or alliances of alliances, and the, the alliances will cooperate to attack other alliances to take their females and to defend against these attacks. And these groups range from four to 14. And after years of watching, we now know that these second order alliances, as we call them, are the core unit of male society in Shark Bay. Um, that's just males all lined up together. So going back to the science fiction comment, and let's, let's again, let's go back to chimpanzees and their complex within group coalition formation. So here we have three chimpanzees, and typically three or four of the top ranking uh, males in the community will vie to be the alpha male. Now, as you know, many mammals simply fight it out, and the biggest and toughest one will win the fight and be the top dog. But chimpanzees use complex coalitions to achieve alpha rank. So you might have this male trying to form a coalition with this male, but at the same time, this male's trying to form a coalition with this male, so it can get very complicated. And Franz Duval wrote an amazing book called Chimpanzee politics describing the complexity. And in fact, my, my book is, is a nod to Franz, Franz's, Franz's book. So the, in the wild, these, these male chimps have to worry about males in other groups. Because if you're out by yourself near the edge of your territory, you could get attacked and even killed by these other males. But just imagine that there was a third community there, and just imagine that these males would go to these males and say, hey, you know, Let's get together, we can cooperate and take their territory. And at the same time, though, these males are going to these males and let's attack them. You'd have the same kind of complex dynamics that you have within, within groups. But you don't have that in chimpanzees. The, the with, between group interactions are just us against them. It's purely hostile. Uh, but you do have that in humans. We have alliances of alliances of alliances. We extrapolate that in modern society right on up to nation states and complex interactions between alliances at all levels. And we see that for the first time in another species in our dolphins in Shark Bay. There's a pair and a trio of males. You can see why I'm saying this is the Rosetta Stone for learning about dolphin intelligence in the wild. Because really the major theory about why some animals have really big brains is to negotiate not where they're finding their food or anything like that, but very complex social relationships and all that goes with that. And if you think about your lives, probably the most complex things you deal with are each other, right? So let's go back to this incredible synchrony, because um, this is amazing. And you see synchronous leaps and so on. And again, there's one other species that has alliances where they have this kind of synchrony. 
You know, it's our species. Uh, the dolphins will also engage in incredible synchronous displays around these estrous females during consortships. So yes, they use aggression to keep the female with them, but they may also have to try to impress her to increase the chance they'll be the father of, her, of the baby. And so here you see the female in the middle and the males are performing synchronous belly slaps going in opposite directions. We just see an incredible variety of these, these displays. I don't think, you know, they're, hey, let's do number 6B, you know? I, I, I think they're making, they're being creative with a lot of these displays. There's some displays we see over and over, but there's some you just go, oh my God, where did that come from? You know, um, and we know that dolphins are phenomenal at imitation. Here, the dolphins have been given the command, do what the human does. That's a pretty good facsimile. And dolphins are also phenomenal at, at imitating sounds, right? All kinds of computer-generated sounds, anything. So they're incredible at imitation. So here's a, a triple synchronous leap, and I, it's shaky because I, I, I want you to see in slow motion. Two of the dolphins are coming towards you and one's going away. On the left-hand side, there's the two coming towards you, one going away. Beautiful. Um, so this is a, a synchronous display called a rooster strut, and you'll see why it has that name. This is wave and shave. It's amazing, isn't it? And trust, side by side, synchronous rooster struts by shave and wave. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. It is. We were watching this and we were saying, that's beautiful, that's gorgeous. And we're scientists, but we still, you know, it's gorgeous. And just to show you that not all displays are uh, two males going synchronously, here's a solo rooster struck by Picante. Now, these second order alliances, we give them all names, and usually based on some individual in the group that gives us a humorous source of a name. So Picante is a member of the Blues Brothers. Um, the, we had uh, Primo was a member of one group, so we named them the Prima Donnas. We have the Hooligans, the Grand Poobahs, the uh, Wow Crowd, the, you know, go, Crocker Spaniels, um, and so on. And in a lot of these groups, there always seems to be one male who's like that guy, you know. He's always getting into trouble, causing trouble, kind of larger than life. And I think CB is that male in the Crocker Spaniels, and Picante is that male in the Blues Brothers. Tokes, toke, seven moves joined. Oh. The, the rooster struck tail flail by uh, Picante. Uh-huh. on that. Got it. He's still going. Picante. <laughs> and this guy's on. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I got him. That's great. Whoa. Whoa little flourish at the end. Yeah. He's very impressed with himself. So now, going in a bit into the creepy realm, we're out with the WOW crowd. All 14 members are there. They have several females. It's a lousy day. It's cloudy. It's windy. It's choppy. It's not nice. But I, they were being really rowdy. And I started hearing this almost sound like a group chant. You know, you know, you know, you know. Just before they attacked one of somebody in the group. So if you listen, you'll hear this. What the hell is that? Over all the balls coming up into the group from 20 meters behind, 24.58. Whoa, intense wow. chase. And I, okay. So we have a lot to learn about dolphin vocalizations. Okay, in the 2000s, we expanded our range to cover up and down the peninsula. And one of the questions we wanted to, to solve was, you know, where was the boundary to the society? If you think about terrestrial mammals, they all live in what we call closed or semi-closed groups. You know them as a wolf pack or a baboon troop or a chimpanzee community. 
And, you know, there is some movement. Typically males, when they mature, have to go up and, and, and make their way into a new group, and there's a bit of a hazing process. But everybody's part of a group, and you don't just stroll in out of the blue. And, and you know, they know everything about everybody in the group. They know everybody. They know their dominance relationships, typically who's, you know, relatives and so on. And so and you're pretty smart about it, so you don't pick on that little one if her big sister's around, right? So, but when you look at this, it's just this, these are the same kind of shape. Each shape here is, is a second order alliance range. And it's just, again, like you saw with the females, it's just a mosaic of overlapping ranges. Now think about the implications of this, because sure, uh, males that you overlap with a lot, you see all the time, you know them well, but imagine at the edge of your range where you don't go very often, there's a male you run into, and maybe two years ago you saw him and defeated him easily, but maybe he's got some new buddies. You don't know. There's a certain amount of uncertainty that must go with this. So it's fascinating. Um, and there's nothing like it on terra firma, so it would just confuse them. Yeah. So, and remarkably, during this decade, we also discovered a third level of alliance. So just like you had uh, associations between individuals, and we wanted to say, what's that about? And there were consorting females. And just like we had associations between pairs and trios, what's that about? The second order alliances, attacking other groups. We were seeing friendly associations between second order alliances. So seven member prima donnas were hanging out sometimes with the 14 member Crocker Spaniels. Well, it turns out functionally they were doing the same thing attacking uh, other groups to take their females and defending against such attacks. There's Arnie to the side. Three taking off that direction. Okay, let's try and get groups uh, if it's possible. Oh, wow. <laughs> These are Blues Brothers at the back here. So anyway, so given that the function of the second and third order alliances are the same, why do you have a third level? I think it's an insurance policy. You know, if you look, they range in size from four to 14. Hey, if you're a small group, you better have some big, you know, bigger group as your buddies. But also, they're often spread out all over the place. I think when I talk about these second order alliances, people often think of like billiard balls bouncing off each other around the bay. And yes, it is impressive when you see all 14 members of the WOW crowd together with six, five, four or five consorted females and their calves. But often they're spread out all over the place. And imagine you're a trio, your buddies aren't around, you have a female and you run into a rival group. It behooves you to have some friends nearby. And we've indeed, we've seen that kind of thing happen where uh, their buddy second order alliance will come to help them in a conflict. So here's looking at Shark Bay again and these, these, these incredible seagrass beds, uh, largest in the world, and, and, and we have this incredibly complex society and I think it's the seagrass beds. There's a high dolphin density, they're running into each other a lot and it might be as simple as if you're going to run into your enemies, you better be with your friends. And, and I think that's why this place, place is so special. If you, they just have not described this level of complexity anywhere else. So the longest running study of bottlenose dolphins is in Sarasota, Florida. It's gone on 10 years longer than our study. They have pairs, no trios, no second order alliances, and no third order alliances. And we just don't think they run into each other enough in competitive circumstances. But it's tough to test the hypothesis because they differ in so many other ways. They're bigger than ours. The males are proportionally larger than the females. The females reproduce at a different rate, lots of things. So we were really excited to find that we have variation right, not just in our population, but right in our social network along the peninsula. As you go from this area up to here, up at the top, you see more trios than pairs. They consort females at a higher rate and they have more new battle scars. And it's the reverse down in here. Now, there, there are a lot of seagrass beds down in here, 
I suspect it's perhaps still marginal habitat because when you go down into here, it's super salty. Have you seen the David Attenborough with the stromatolites? The old, yeah, so they're stromatolites. This is 60 parts per thousand, and normal ocean water is like 36. And stromatolites are down in this super salty water. And this is kind of a transition zone where it's saltier than, than the sea, but, but, but nothing like this. So this might be sort of marginal, and so this is very exciting. So we can start testing hypotheses in this population. Um, one other factor, other than the, the, the abundance of fish, might simply be that sound travels better out here. So you're going to learn that your rivals are there easier because they, you hear, hear them carrying on. So now I want to give you a sneak preview of what I think is the most ambitious and exciting dolphin project ever that we're going to start, hopefully this coming uh, field season. Um, and we're launching it now. We're, it's our budget, we're trying to raise a couple hundred thousand each year for 10 years. And I'm calling it a new beginning for two reasons. First, we have an am amazing team. So this is Michael Crutzen, who's a director of the Anthropology Institute at the University of Zurich. And he uh, runs our genetics lab. This is one of the top dolphin communication people we recruited a few years ago, Stephanie King, who's at the University of Bristol. This is her partner, Simon, who is uh, both a population biologist and an animal behaviorist. And this is that, what was that 19-year-old kid, Mike Hightaus, right? He's now the Dean of Marine Sciences at FIU. After this semester, I'm retiring from UMass Dartmouth. I'm taking an informal position at Florida International. They have a wonderful ecology group down there run by Mike. So I'm very excited about joining that group. So we have this amazing team. And the idea is instead of doing individual projects sequentially, we're going to take advantage of the team and technology to look at a, multiple questions at once. You know, we have the most complex non-human society in the world in Shark Bay. It deserves to be studied really full on, and that's what we want to do. And, and this is really driven by the technology advances. The technology has advanced so much in every sphere of our research that we can now ask questions we couldn't touch 10 years ago. So for years and years and years, I had an underwater microphone in the water, a hydrophone, and I could hear the dolphins, but I couldn't tell who was talking because we can't localize sound underwater. And the dolphins don't help us. They don't move their mouth parts when they, when they, <laughs> when they make noise. But now we can set up a hydrophone array in the boat, right, and localize sound. Drones. I'm going to show you some amazing drone footage in just a bit. That's really changing everything for us. Um, the genetics has gotten incredibly more sophisticated. We can estimate relatedness in a much more refined way now. Um, and, and this is an ROV. We can map the habitat. And this black box is an incredibly sophisticated echo sounder, um, you know, which you used a fish finder, as some people call them. It's like watching a video. It's like two million hertz. It's like watching a video. So we're able to be able to look at the distribution of their fish and see if there's more fish in different areas and if they specialize in different kinds of uh, feeding behaviors and watch them feeding in real time, we hope. So here's Stephanie King in 2016. And what she's doing with her hydrophone array is keeping track of where the dolphins are in relation to the array and the boat. So it's a dolphin whistle. Came right next to the surface, next to the female. They're a couple of meters, 270 degrees. So 270 degrees. So she's keeping track of them. So when she goes back later, she can map that. Oh, wow! Look at that. Yeah, get a 180 within 10 meters. Female just glided through the surface. Male chasing after her quickly. So here you have the the, the, the sound. You have the four hydrophones, and so the sound will arrive from, from one dolphin at the hydrophone at different times. And you can triangulate on that dolphin. So you know it's not these guys, it's not this guy, this guy, it's that one. And using this technique, she was able to learn the names of males from three second order alliances. So dolphins have individually distinctive whistles. It's their name, their signature whistle. Uh, and so there was some question, that's been known a long time, but it was not known if, if allied males would, also, would maintain individual whistles or if they'd have an alliance-specific whistle. Well, Stephanie was able to show that each male maintains their own individual name, 
And she'd also shown previously in another population that dolphins can imitate each other's name and call each other by name. So this, I mean, the sky's the limit in terms of dolphin communication. Potentially, they could even gossip. You know, two dolphins could be together and make the whistle of another dolphin, attach a little affect or emotion to that. Like, I don't like that one, you know. Uh, and that would be basically simple gossip. So we're very excited about what she's going to be doing and, and has been doing. So here's some incredible drone. This just changes our world. So here's three members of the hooligans petting. So we can watch that from the drone. I can't wait to learn how to use a drone and start using one myself. That's, so this, this we didn't even see from the boat. So what happened, you had this rowdy group of about a dozen males swimming along, and then evidently two of them had an issue with each other. And when dolphins have an argument, they line up head to head, we call it a tiff, they shake their heads up and down and squawk at each other, and it may or may not escalate into a fight. Um, and, and so you'll see, they're all cruising along here. Now, right about now, you see these two dolphins, see they're lined up, they're tiffing. I did too, you did not, you did not, you did not. And then they, they, they settle whatever the issue is, and they go back and rejoin the group. But they synced, they did a sync before they, so they made up. So sometimes they'll fight after that. So here we have uh, several prima donnas are going to join with their buddy alliance, the Crocker Spaniels. That doesn't mean that individuals can't still have issues with each other, as was evident on this day. Um, so this is um, Big Midgey Bites, named after the little thing that our scourge that bites us in June and July. And, and here we see Deet is, is nervous, I think, and he's petting with this other one, and he's going to duck on the other side. Maybe he thinks he's going to hide. Big is having none of it, boom. <laughs> and they chased him off. Uh, so I don't know what went on before, you know, but. So we can see these incredible synchronous displays. We, we, the males do all these loops on either side of the female. We call them butterfly displays. And so deeper water males uh, often will spread out to forage alone. If they have a female, they need to sort of keep tabs on her. And one way they do that is to keep her in the middle of a triangle. And so they'll, they'll all be together at the surface, and the, you'll see the males dive in, in, in a, going away in a triangle and then come back together at the surface. And that's what you're seeing here. Uh, so where are they here? You've got that one, that one, that, that one. And so there's the female, male, 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 in a triangle, and watch how they... See, she's right in the middle, they're reconverging. And so how are they coordinating this? You know, they're probably using sound. That'll be something we, we uh, try to figure out in the dolphin decade. So this one up here, maybe he didn't catch a fish last time, he's gonna get back down and get busy. The other two, um, check out the female. They'll get kind of behind her there, have a little pet with each other. How'd you do? I caught a fish, you catch one? I little one, yeah. And, and, uh, and then she dives, and look at them spreading out. And there they go. Amazing. So this picture of Barcelona is to remind me that just last month in December, we had uh, the Marine Mammal Conference, which we have every two years. It was in Barcelona. And so to show you that drones aren't simply going to be valuable for watching behavior, um, there were two talks that are really going to change what we're doing going forward. One is that we can now estimate the body length of our little guys using a drone. And the other one is we can estimate the body condition. And that's going to be very important. Because in 2011, we had a marine heat wave. You know, you've been hearing all about the fires in Australia and the heat wave on land. Well, there are also marine heat waves. And in 2011, we had a, a marine heat wave that was very damaging to the seagrass beds and damaging to the dolphins and turtles and everything. Um, and so there's actually a marine heat wave along the west coast of Australia right now. So what we want to get going immediately, if we can raise the funds, is to get drones and start measuring condition of all these animals. It's useful for lots of reasons. Length and condition can also be used to you know, see who the, the longer, bigger males have more access to females. 
But it's very important just to look at the health of the population and measure uh, how, how well they're doing and be able to detect any changes ahead of time. So in any project like this, for decades we've been going, you've got a lot of people that have helped us uh, over the years, Australian Research Council, uh, New York Explorers Club, my first little grant. Uh, National Geographic Society has been there consistently. Annie Gordon Getty gave us a lot at one point. Um, lots of uh, wonderful, the, the resort has been incredible, you know, basically no, no rent for decades, um, which has just been a godsend. So we have this 501c3 foundation, so we're looking for you know, any kind of donations to help with this Dolphin Decade project um, and get it off the ground. Uh, and returning, I think, I hope I've convinced you that uh, this place, this miraculous place in Western Australia is really the Rosetta Stone for learning about dolphin intelligence in the wild. You can learn more about going here, whoop, here or there you go. Thank you.